I'd like to introduce by, uh, by introducing my wonderful co-authors, Catherine Charsley and Sarah Spencer, who initiated the project. Catherine Charsley is based in Bristol, Sarah Spencer at Compass in Oxford, and Marta Bolognani, who used to be based at Bristol as well, and who collected the qualitative data in this project. I was mainly responsible for the quantitative analysis uh, in the project, and I will show you quite a few graphs from these uh, in the talk. So in the upcoming 40 minutes or so, I'll take you through the context of the project, the research design, I'll provide you with the definition of integration that we've used, I will show you some data on the changes in transnational marriage rates over cohorts, the relation between education and marriage migration, employment, and then we'll end with some of our core conclusions. So marriage or partner migration is one of the main sources of immigration to Western Europe, including to the UK. There's been an increasing tendency to view a certain type of marriage migration as problematic in terms of integration. And these are intra-ethnic transnational marriages of ethnic minorities. So and by this, I mean, for example, when European descendants of migrants from Pakistan, Turkey, or North, Ar North Africa marry a partner from their parents' or grandparents' country of origin, and this partner then migrates uh, to join uh, these descendants of migrants here in Europe. As you probably know, these debates tend to devote little attention to marriage migrants who marry members of the white majority in European countries. This intra-ethnic marriage migration is often discussed both as a sign of a lack of integration and as a barrier to integration. So these marriages are seen as a sign of a lack of integration because they are assumed to show a focus on the origin country rather than on the residence country. They're assumed to show uh, a focus on maintaining traditions and religions and as an expression of conservative gender norms and sometimes also as an expression of a strong role of the parents and the family um, in the partner choice, which is also considered a lack of integration. They are also seen as a barrier to integration because they are considered to create a kind of temporal loop in which there is a first generation in every generation, meaning the process of integration is sent back to the beginning because new migrants keep on being added to the migrant community in Europe. They're also seen as importing poverty through the assumed limited education and labor market prospects of migrant spouses. And they're seen as importing traditionalism, particularly around gender expectations, reinforcing cultural differences with implications, for example, or most importantly, I would say for women's employment. So the restrictions to spousal immigration that we've seen evolve uh, across, especially Western Europe in the last decade or two, have increasingly been justified with reference to the integration concerns that I just listed. In the UK, um, which has followed other European examples, we've seen pre-entry English language requirements for migrant spouses and income requirements for sponsors presented as measures to promote the integration of the, of the marriage migrants and of the communities already established here. However, what is striking when you look at the research is that there's actually rather limited evidence of the relationships between marriage migration and processes of integration. And what there is tends to be on particular aspects of integration, most commonly on labor market migration. So in our book, we examine this question about the relationship between the two. And we focus on the two largest ethnic groups involved in the UK context. These are British Pakistani Muslims, which in the British discourse uh, is the group that is the focal point of integration concerns, and British Indian Sikhs, who are sometimes more presented as the model minority in the UK context. We compare, um, we use both survey data and qualitative research. So the survey data comes from the UK Labour Force Survey. Uh, we did explore other survey data sets that include more questions on attitudes and other types of behaviours, but because we're very keen on focusing in on these two specific groups, we found that those data sets, such as the British Attitude Survey, don't have a sufficiently large sample of these groups. Um, whereas the Labour Force Survey does have that, it has about 6,000 uh, couples who qualify for our criteria, of which the majority is still Pakistani, so it's about 4,500 uh, Pakistani Muslims in our sample, uh, and about 1,500 Indian Sikhs. In our, uh, we also collected 
um, semi-structured interviews. And here we use the sibling pair design. So Marta Bolognani looked for respondents where there were multiple siblings in a household and ideally they would have different marriage choices. So one being part of a transnational couple and the other being part of an international uh, couple, because uh, this would allow us to gain most insight we felt in how these different types of marriages both come about and also how they then influence the lives of these couples. In our analysis, we compare two types of intra-ethnic couples. The first type we call intranational couples. These are couples where both spouses are from the UK um, and transnational couples. This is a couple in which one partner is born or, or at least raised in the UK and the other partner is a migrant from India or Pakistan. We furthermore distinguish between migrant husband and migrant wife couples because there is, even though most uh, partners coming over our wives, there's a substantial minority of migrant husbands. And we believed, and also as part of the discourse, that there are important gender differences that we wanted to look at. Now, of course, because we want to explore the relation between marriage migration and integration, we had to be clear about what we mean by integration, which, as you surely know, is a controversial concept. Integration research has been criticized for including normative assumptions on how migrants ought to integrate, for emphasizing migrants' responsibility for integration rather than looking at the society as a whole, and for a selective focus on particular aspects of integration at the expense of a wider perspective. We try to come up with a definition that seeks to avoid these traps. So the definition is shown on the slide. And as you will see, this definition identifies five dimensions or spheres in which integration processes can take place. Firstly, the structural, so for instance, the labor market or the housing market. Secondly, the social, such as social interactions and relationships. The cultural, such as changing attitudes, behavior and lifestyle. Civic and political participation, such as community life and the democratic process. And finally, identity. So develop a shared identity and a sense of belonging. It also notes that integration processes develop over time, that they can proceed, but also change direction. For instance, engagement in the labor market can cease within unemployment. Sarah Spencer and Catherine Charsley brought all of these ideas together in the heuristic model that you can see here on this slide. The diagram shows three characteristics of the processes that we particularly want to draw your attention to. Firstly, we show that individuals are parts of families and social networks, whether in the country of residence or transnationally. And these families and social networks can provide opportunities, but also constraints across the different spheres of integration. Secondly, you see that we put arrows between the dimensions or spheres. These highlights the impacts which engagements in one dimension can have on engagement in another. So this interdependence of domains is important and sometimes overlooked. It can be positive, but also negative. So for instance, for some British Indian Sikh respondents who would score as highly integrated on most conventional measures, they spoke negative um, about the negative impact of their political engagement on identity when recent revelations about the British government's role in the Golden Temple Massacre led them to question their sense of Britishness. Right? Okay. Finally, this model shows the various types of what we ended up calling effectors, which is a term that's borrowed from biology, which can impact on these processes. So we can see effectors relating to individuals, such as gender and qualifications, effectors affecting the family, such as resources, expectations or caring responsibilities, Society, such as the availability of jobs, but also of discrimination. Transnational engagement, such as the need to send remittances. And finally, to policy intervention, not just related to immigration and integration, such as visa rules or language class provision, but also the wider policy landscape. And most importantly, the rules concerning labor market and education, to which I will return in one of the examples I'll provide later. So this understanding of integration 
situate marriage migrations amid the full complexity of the processes at play and the multiplicities of the effectors that could be impacting them. It also drew our attention to what we could and could not do in our project. So for instance, methodologically, it's much easier to get data on migrants and their families than on the job opportunities available at a particular place and point in time. And given the complexity of the processes of integration, it's key that any research identifies and acknowledges its inevitable limitations. So this model, um, we informed our research design and our analysis, and our findings in turn reinforce aspects of the model brought out in each of the chapters in our book. Now, as you can see, we're dealing with what, quite a wide range of issues, so I won't have time in this talk to go through all the different uh, dimensions that we've identified. But we write about researching integration as being similar to untangling a complicated knot identifying the various strands and teasing apart their relationship to each other. So what I'll do in this talk is to show you some of the strands and how they come together. Before going into some of the strands, I would like to show you the developments in the transnational marriage rates over time. The UK, like many other countries, had had varying policies targeting marriage migration. And we thought it would be interesting to look at the changes in the rates over time and to see if we can link them in any way to the policy shifts that have taken place. The labor force survey data that we use for our quantitative analysis does not include data on a year of marriage. So instead, we explore changes over time by looking at the different birth cohorts. Yeah? So what you see the 1950s in the, in the graph, that's people who were born in the 1950s. 1960s, people who were born in the 1960s, and so on and so forth. This graph and the other graphs that I will show you in this talk are all descriptive statistics. And they show the group averages or more often proportions, but I will, in my discussion of the um, graphs, comment on the role of possible confounding variables. So, as I hope you have already seen, there is a clear trend of decreasing transnational marriage uh, for men in both groups and for Indian Sikh women. Those born in the 1950s and 60s were married transnationally much more often at a much higher rates than those born in the 70s and 80s. British Pakistani women appear to be the only exception to this downward trend, uh, but this partially had to do with there were not that many um, female pioneer migrants in the Pakistani Muslim community, um, so that distorts slightly the image that we see. So some care is needed to interpret this data. A considerable proportion of the most recent cohorts would not have been married at the time of the survey. If there's a relationship between age of marriage and couple type, for example, if transnational marriages tend to take place at an earlier age, this would distort findings for these younger cohorts. So we looked at what is the marriage age among these groups, and we found that um, at least in the labor force survey, the clear majority of the groups in our sample are married by the age of 30. Therefore, we reran our analysis only looking at those who are aged 30 or above. And we actually still find clearly this decreasing trend uh, in transnational uh, marriage. Yeah. So although we do see that significant proportions of British Pakistani Muslims and British Indian Sikhs continue to marry partners from overseas, our analysis represents the first clear evidence of a reduction in the prevalence of transnational marriage for these groups, which echoes decreasing trends in ethnic minority transnational marriage reported elsewhere in Europe. So what about the link to policy? One of the key policies that the UK had was the primary purpose rule. Under this rule, people wanting to come to the UK as a marriage migrant would need to show that the marriage was the primary purpose of their migration rather than economic interests. Yeah. So this, of course, is a slightly arbitrary rule which creates a, a fair bit of space for applicants to be rejected. You would then expect that the abolition of this rule in 1997 would make it easier to come over to the UK as a marriage migrant, or otherwise said, would make it easier for people born and raised in the UK to marry a partner from abroad. As most Pakistani Muslims and Indian Sikhs are married by the time they're 30, the legislative change in 1997 should have mainly affected the 1970s and 1980 cohorts in our data. 
the reduction in transnational marriage in these cohorts compared to the earlier cohorts is thus particularly striking given the removal of this significant policy restriction on transnational marriage affecting South Asian spousal migration. New restrictions on migration uh, of migrant spouses have been implemented in the UK in 2010 and 2012. So obviously the uh, LFS data does not allow us to see any effects of these changes, right? Because it's too recent. Very few people in our data set would have been married after this, these restrictions came into place. Um, however, it's noteworthy that we can already clearly see a decrease in these transnational rates before uh, this restrictive legislation was introduced. Another big debate or part of the debate about uh, marriage migration and integration is the role of education. So as many previous studies have shown that for men, the lower educated are more likely to contract a transnational marriage than the higher educated. But for women, previous studies have shown mixed findings. So our analysis supports these general findings for Pakistani Muslim men, Sikh Indian men, and for Indian Sikh women we do find that the higher educated are less likely to engage in a transnational marriage than the lower educated. Often this relation has been explained by pointing out that lower educated have fewer chances of finding a spouse in the local marriage market, and so turn to the parental origin country to wind in their options, potentially having the migration to the UK on offer as a way of attracting a better spouse than they would have otherwise done, right? Or thinking, and that um, the lower educated are more likely to be in a transnational marriage because they are more traditional and therefore prefer somebody from the parental origin country. However, the interview materials also suggest another mechanism, namely um, some children who do poorly in school in the UK are sent um, back to their, by their parents to the country of origin to kind of to sort, sort them out. Uh, and while they spend time in this country, so in Pakistan or India, they might meet people who they end up marrying. Yeah? So also education shapes the possibilities for either meeting um, um, a spouse in the UK or in the parental origin country. We also found in the sibling pairs in the interviews that it tends to be the less educated sibling who is most often in a transnational marriage. However, it's difficult to say whether this actually shows that the level of education uh, leads to this marriage um, option because it's confounded by birth order. For many families, we saw that the elder siblings are less educated and more often in a transnational marriage, but that we also see a change in parental and community attitudes, both towards education and towards marriage, which might confound this relationship. In public debates, the focus lies with the presumed low education of the migrant spouse. In this graph here, you can show what we call the education matching in two couple times. So what is the relative education of the partner versus the, the UK spouse? It shows that for both genders and groups, educational homogamy, so that is both partners having more or less the same level of education, is the dominant pattern, right? So these are all the orange uh, parts of the graphs. And so educational monogamy, homogamy is the uh, dominant pattern for both international and transnational couples. We do also see that there is a slightly higher share of lower educated partners amongst those in transnational marriages, right? So these are the grayish uh, parts of the graph uh, to the right. Um, however, for Indian Sikhs, we also see that people who engage in a transnational marriage, versus those who marry within the UK, are quite likely to have a partner that's higher educated rather than lower educated from themselves. So both this, the higher prevalence of higher educated partner, at least for Indian Sikhs in transnational marriages, and the very high prevalence of educational homogamy go against common ideas about um, a negative selection of, of partners in terms of education in case of transnational marriages, right? This goes against the assumption that these marriages, at least for the two groups that we looked at, are a way of importing poverty by selecting low educated partners. Could a contrary, 
given that there's generally a lower level of education in India and Pakistan, the trends that we see here actually suggest that there's a positive selection of uh, migrant spouses in terms of their education. The low levels that we do see of education among migrant partners then are mainly a reflection of the low level of educations of UK partners who engage in these marriages. So again, the homogamy here could be to two partners that are low educated, but that's not because um, marrying a marriage migrant means marrying a low educated person. It means marrying a similarly educated person, but given that you're low educated, that person is then also low educated. The qualitative material suggests that ideas about a fit between partner and families play an important role in marriage preferences, but this can work out in different ways. So it could be that people consider a migrant partner to be a better fit for their situation because it facilitates a relationship with and care for their parents because of shared language and shared ideas about households, uh, division of household labor. But it can also be that a fit considers to be marrying a partner from the UK uh, to avoid a socioeconomic um, burden, as sometimes these partners coming from Pakistan and India are seen. In the interviews, we could not uncover a clear relation between these different preferences or these different conceptions of a good fit uh, and education levels. For the remainder of this presentation, I'd like to focus on the labor market. This is because much existing research focuses on employment and often takes this as a key indicator in the structural domain. So here are the labor force service statistics on employment by couple type, gender, and ethnic group. And just to already preempt a question, this is the percentage employed as percentage of the total. So unemployed and inactive make up the remainder up to the 100%. So in the book, of course, we discuss issues of discrimination and lack of recognition of qualifications, foreign qualifications, uh, because these differences in um, employment rates aren't just a reflection of differences in education. However, for now, I want to explore some other aspects. Because these kinds of statistics are frequently used as evidence of lack of integration, low employment rates for women, particularly for migrant wives. And we can indeed clearly see that migrant wives have lower rates of paid employment than their British co ethnics This is particularly the case among the Pakistani Muslim group. So you can see that amongst Pakistani Muslims, uh, women who are migrant wives, only about 15% of them uh, is in paid employment at the time of the survey, compared to about 35% for women who are in international marriage, or women who are born and raised in the UK and who married a migrant husband. Levels of employment overall are much higher among the Indian C group. And in our qualitative material, it seemed that employment was expected of Indian Sikh women alongside their domestic roles. So that's a clear area of uh, ethnic variation that we saw. We can also, based on this analysis, comment on the idea that marrying a man from overseas, so for UK women to engage in a transnational marriage, who is assumed to have more traditional gender role expectations, this migrant husband, might suppress women's employment. While there does seem to be lower employment among British Indian Sikh women who are married to migrants, as you can see in the bottom right uh, graph, Further analysis suggests that their low level of education uh, compared to those married within the UK explains this. Yeah? So once you control for education, there's no difference in the employment rates of UK-born Indian Sikh women that are married to a UK partner versus those who are married to a migrant partner. Similarly, we can see for British Pakistani women that those married to migrant husbands have a similar employment rate as those married to um, UK Pakistani Muslim husbands. So let's take this issue and start to trace its wider connections. Because in our qualitative material, for some British Pakistani women, marriage to a husband from Pakistan actually seemed to be part of a trajectory of maintaining or increasing autonomy. For those of you who are familiar with the marriage migration literature, this is a version of the hypothesis posited by John Leavens uh, some 
20 odd years ago, which argues that transnational marriage can be a way of increasing autonomy rather than a reflection of a lack of autonomy, mainly by allowing distance between the woman herself and her in-laws who are far away. In this case of three sisters, the eldest, Lanika, married a cousin from Pakistan who moved to the UK to live with her. So because her husband moved in with her and because her in-laws were far away in Pakistan, she avoided the conventional daughter in law law. And she stayed to live close to her family, enjoying the support of her family and also she felt considerable freedom. Because of this positive experience, she recommended her sister Madiha uh, to do the same. And Madia indeed also married a migrant. She saw an additional benefit in distancing herself from her caring demands from her natal family and has embarked on a wider social life, uh, for instance, by fundraising for her children's school. So Madia is not in paid employment at the moment of the interview, but the marriage has expanded her engagement in the social and civic spheres. Interestingly, by contrast, their youngest sister, Cantara, had what was described as a couple-initiated marriage, yeah? so to contrast with an arranged marriage, with a British Pakistani. So this intra-ethnic marriage versus the transnational marriages of her sisters is something that would conventionally be viewed as perhaps the more progressive option. Cantada moved to another area of the city to live with her in-laws, and her in-laws actually restricted her freedom considerably. This experience confirms the beliefs of her sisters, namely it's easier and it gives you more freedom if you marry a migrant. The example of this family challenges the often assumed association between transnational marriage and traditionalism. And it also really undermines the idea of a cultural impact of a first generation in every generation taking the family back to zero in integration terms. One migrant coming into a British extended family is unlikely to be able to set the tone for the household culture in terms of gender roles and so on. And we have some fascinating material on extended family living, which explores this further, but that I unfortunately can't uh, discuss during this talk. The issue of traditionalism is complicated, not least because it's one you will often hear discussed by British South Asians themselves. Families look for a bride in a subcontinent often expect a woman from India or Pakistan to be more traditional in their general expectations, happy to accept domestic and caring roles. Although, as we saw for a few Sikhs, that often goes alongside with the expectations that they will engage in paid employment. Receiving family expectations are one variety of effectors on the trajectories of their new members. So we had several examples in the qualitative material of particularly more educated women from India and Pakistan. Yeah, because as mentioned, the stereotype of the uneducated migrant bride masks that actually quite a few of these men and women have a high level of education. Um, these women often find that their own, or not often, <laughs> sometimes find that their own aspirations to work or live more autonomously come into conflict with the expectations of the British families they married into. So again, this complicates the idea that traditionalism can be equated with the origin country uh, and opposed to uh, being born and raised in the UK. I want to go back to the employment graph and now focus on the migrant husbands. Because in the discourses treating employment as a marker of integration, what is less often noted is the very high rates for migrant husbands they don't have lower employment rates than the British, their British-born co-ethnics. And that speaks strongly to one of the advantages of a migrant coming into a UK family, as they are usually able to help their new member gain employment. An interesting case in point here is that of Sabia's husband. When he arrived from Pakistan, her parents found him work in an Asian-run shop, where he worked for 10 years before becoming a taxi driver. She tells us they, the shop owners, really supported him a lot, but he worked very hard there as well. He worked long hours and he did everything that they wanted him to do. Apparently he is the only person who has worked there for that length of time. Eventually he got his driver's license. I used to teach him driving as well, and then he got his license. One of my uncles helped him do all that, and then he started taxiing. While this ethnic network has the advantage of enabling these men to find work, paid work quickly, there are also downsides. 
The work they do find, as in the example here, is often low skilled and thus low paid with unsociable hours. For Pakistani migrant men, we saw that the taxi sector, as in this example, is seen as a step up. We find that one in four employed Pakistani Muslim migrant husbands in the survey is a taxi driver, one in four. But getting into this field takes time and resources, a certain level of local knowledge, linguistic proficiency are required, and of course you need the driver's license and then the taxi license. So we see that in the first years of their stay, only few migrant husbands in the Galifest samples are engaged in taxiing. However, this increases with the duration of residence, and out of the group that has been in the UK for 16 years or longer, we find that no less than 40% of Pakistani migrant husbands works as a taxi driver. Whilst our respondents often consider taxi driving to be preferable to the job alternatives, for example, because of the flexibility in working hours, it has been uh, described as an extremely marginal form of self-employment. So what do these stories, examples show us? These examples bring us to another key aspect of our conceptual models, the interaction processes between the different domains. Because those jobs that families can provide are often low paid, and a migrant husband is often expected not just to support their new family in the UK, but also to remit to their parents, and they will take these jobs. So to fulfill these dual responsibilities, to the family in the UK and in Pakistan or India, we encountered migrant husbands often work long and antisocial hours. And that time left, uh, some of the Pakistani migrant husbands we encountered, we encountered with little time and energy for building new social networks or investing in skills which could improve their employment situation in the course of a few years. One person, for example, telling us that because of the antisocial hours he worked, he would fall asleep during his language course and his teacher suggested he'd better quit, uh, which he then did. So although employment is commonly used as an indicator of integration and one of the ways that can facilitate wider processes, all these supposed additional benefits that come with work, such as uh, developing your social network and cultural familiarity and language skills, in these cases, poor work combined with life curse and migration issues have the opposite effect because of the quick move to employment and the type of employment people moved into, it actually becomes more difficult for them to integrate in the other dimensions of society. And that example of a busy working migrant husband brings us to the temporality in a wider sense, because as I explained when I discussed the model, we see integration as a temporal process that develops over time. And it has relationships with other temporal processes, including the life course. Because we included couples whose marriage did not involve migration, we could disentangle transnational marriage and marriage migration as one effector from others related to the life course. For pretty much all our participants, marriage and the birth of children, which is often expected to follow quickly on the marriage and the migration, signaled a new phase of the life course. When men, as we have seen, were under particular pressure to earn for their new family, and the social sphere tended to become more focused on family life for men and women. Yeah, and we saw this both for transnational and for international couples. But for marriage migrants, the move to a new country at the same time as entering this phase of the life course, it happens at the same time. So not only do work and parenthood often leave little time for a wider social life, migrants' lack of social networks intensifies the social focus on the family and transnational remittance obligations can heighten the pressure on men in particular to work long and unsociable hours. For migrant wives, while well, even those who didn't grow up expecting to work often develop an interest in employment from watching their British sisters-in-law or other family members. But having come into a new country and straight into this family focused phase, spending many years in these patterns while children were young, mean that it may be challenging to develop the knowledge and confidence to enter the workforce later on. So we suggested that signposting and assistance isn't just needed when people arrive in the country, but should also be available later. The issue of temporality and aspirations also provides an opportunity to explore ways in which effectors of various kinds interact. Nabila is a Pakistani migrant wife who has an MA in English literature 
and who has taught at university in Pakistan. She needs to convert her qualifications in order to teach in the UK, and her husband and his family are supportive of this aspiration. However, as a recent migrant, she cannot apply for a student loan that would pay for her higher overseas, still, student fees. So this puts training beyond the family's economic reach. By the time she's lived in the UK long enough to access student funding and pay the home student fees, it's likely that she will have entered motherhood and the caring responsibilities will make it very difficult for her um, to, to uh, then engage in the education and then find a way to high level employment. So Nabila's story speaks once more to that the life course issue, um, but also illustrates the way in which a policy affected can operate as a barrier to integration despite um, apparent advantages in terms of factors relating to individual human capital. And in her case, having a master's degree and a family, in her case, a supportive family. So I hope these examples have given you a taster of how we go about untangling the knot between all these different um, dimensions and, and uh, levels in the book. There's plenty of more to, to discover in the book. The chapters cover various aspects of integration and their interconnections, including family relations and intergenerational living, social life and belonging. Along the way, we uncover complexities that challenge many of the simplistic assumptions about ethnic minority transnational marriage, which appear in policy and sometimes also in academic discourse. And in, on, in our discussion on belonging and identity, we also chart some of the negative impacts that these kinds of finger pointing discourses of problematic integration and the restrictions to family life, which they are assumed to justify and which our, our participants were often well aware of were targeted at them in particular, can themselves also have on processes of integration. Okay. So also on behalf of my co-authors, I'd like to thank some of the key people without whom's work the book would not have been possible. And of course, to all the participants whose memorable accounts and turns of phrase made working on the book such a pleasure. In case that uh, this presentation has whetted your appetite for the book, please see at the bottom right, I think it was also in the announcement, there's a discount code that's valid both for the hardcover and for the ebook um, version of the book. And this code is valid until the end of this month. The project has also resulted in several other papers that I've listed here. And as you can see, uh, most of these are available uh, open access. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Evelyn, for uh, this great presentation. I very much enjoyed it. And thank you for all the attendees um, for listening uh, to this presentation. I'd like to leave the floor now for any discussion, any questions. You may um, you have several options for uh, asking your question. You can write in the box and I can read it out loud. You can ask it yourself by using the uh, raise the hand button or yeah, if there are not many questions, you can just write also in the chat box. I'd like to, uh, to ask a question and we can start. Um, hi, um, good afternoon. Um, can I, shall I stop? Uh, sorry, I, I can't see you, so I'll stop sharing the presentation. Oh, no, I should. Um, ah, Esther, yes. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, um, thank you for the presentation. It was very insightful and interesting. Um, um, in the beginning, I listened, but I was a bit distracted to understand. You mentioned something with poverty. This, this, this the study you did linked with um uh, poverty that they are, I miss that part, if you could explain so it. So yeah, what we sense. often hear in discussions, right, especially in policy debates, is that marriage migration leads to importing poverty. Uh, because the assumption is that the, the migrant husbands and the migrant wives are low educated, um, or not educated at all. And because of this, they will find it difficult to find employment. So that means if people choose to marry these people, that makes that there's a risk that their family will become or remain poor because of that decision. Yeah. And what we actually find is that this assumption is not supported, at least by the evidence that we've looked at here, that actually the people that come from India and Pakistan to the UK are um, 
equally educated to the people they're married, and sometimes they're even higher educated. And this is especially striking because education levels in Pakistan and India are lower than in the UK. So rather than the idea that families or people who choose to marry somebody from the ancestral home country don't care about education or even prefer a low educated person, we actually see there seems to be a slightly positive selection uh, on education. Okay, because I, I, I thought um, um, there are several reasons why people choose to migrate or go to another country or choose to marry someone. And why would that be a problem? But then when I listen further, it is also, um, so for example, if I migrate to like um, the Netherlands, because I'm in, in Maastricht, but I, I come here to, to uh, and marry someone from Maastricht, then... Um, then it depends on like the policy of the Netherlands for me as a migrant to like go further in life with everything um, I wanted to achieve. Yeah. So then it means that maybe we should look like at the policies per country regarding migration to like solve these problems. Is I don't know if I intake or... So, so I think, yes, of course, this is mainly the debate we try to engage in is the debate that has been going on in, in the UK, in the Netherlands, in France, in Germany, in Denmark, Sweden, all these yeah. that have substantial migrant communities and that see a substantial rate of transnational marriage, which has been constructed as a problem. And what we try to challenge here is that this idea that this is a problem in two ways. First of all, by looking more closely at who are the people that come to marry here, right? And how... Uh, how do they find life here? And then also, what are the barriers that they face, right? And I think as you, you raised the, the legislation here, I think the last example uh, of Nabila is a good example of how a highly educated woman is hindered in her um, desire and attempts to build up a strong life here for herself because she cannot access uh, the education she needs to get our qualifications acknowledged. So in that sense, I think that supports your idea that we need to look at the policies that are in place. And so is our argument, we needn't only look at the immigration policies, but also on the wider policies, such as in education and employment, and how did this affects this, this particular group of migrants. Yeah, because, because this migration uh, topic is getting more broader and more popular. So I think maybe as um, countries or the government should like more be open to receive and and like um, make it a bit more um, flexible for these people because this is something we not really can like ban out of the world because it will happen in different reasons, maybe because of natural disasters or whatever people will migrate. And I think maybe we can yeah look at that part a bit for like, um, being more flexible with the policies regarding these groups of people. Yeah, no, I think that would be good. But I think, as you probably also know, that the current climate in many Europe yeah. doesn't feel ready for that yet. But I think that's our responsibility as researchers, right? Yeah. You say, I'm going, migration will happen. Uh, and the best you can do as policymakers is to think about how to make it work best for all concerned uh, parties. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's true. These overt fears. Uh, especially because a lot of them don't find a strong evidence base. Yeah, that's true. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I had a question. Uh, my camera is not on uh, because it's broken, actually. Okay. Uh, Micheline? Uh, I'm, yes, Micheline. Okay. I am a researcher from you and you. I'm not at all uh, a specialist on migration. I was just listening uh, out of pure interest. So sorry if my uh, question is a bit uh, maybe on the margin of what you would like to uh, discuss, but I was wondering, you have, you compared to groups, those that marry uh, a person from the, uh, let's say, origin country, and then another person who is married to uh, a British national, uh, not yes, national, but from the same ethnic ethno-religious group. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly my my point. 
Um, so you're actually comparing the, these two groups, but I was wondering if you would really want to um, provide an answer that that would like uh, ha have some substance to counter those uh, widely held beliefs that uh, this uh, uh, my marriage migration is a problem, like uh, in the popular debate. I was wondering if wh why you take that group as a comparison, because you now you're actually probably comparing uh, two groups that are culturally um, uh, very related. Or, or, yeah, they, that share the same values and norms, and so you're actually reinforcing that 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 speech. Let's say because it looks like they are an isolated community with comparable, um, yeah, um, how should I say? Well, well I think... Maybe if, you, maybe if your question, if I may summarize your question, is why yeah. also include inter-ethnic marriages? The answer to that is quite simple. The inter-ethnic marriage rate in these groups are really low. They're less than 10%. Uh, don't have enough data for, for a comparison. Or at least yeah. as time will progress, this is likely to increase. Like yeah. we did discuss this many times because we agree with you that it would make for a fuller comparison. Yeah. Numbers, at least for these two communities, uh, don't make for enough statistical powers to do this away. Yeah, and do you could you just show descriptive statistics? Do that differ if yeah, you have I looked can, at them? I will if uh, I will not even there are so few people, like there are 31 Pakistani Muslim women that are in an inter-ethnic marriage. Yeah. Descriptive statistics, I think, then are not uh, particularly meaningful. How big is the sample part that you use now? I'm, I'm just going to see if I can show you the table quickly. Uh, if I can show it in the original, or it might be, sorry, if you just hang in there. It's difficult. Okay, let's see if it wants to open. No. Point two. Or point one. Okay. I have the table. Now I need to. By the way, sharing it again with you. Share screen. Okay. So this is the word version of the table. Okay. Bigger? Yeah. <laughs> so you, for instance, see out of the almost 2,000 uh, UK Pakistani Muslim men, yeah. um, 61 are married with white British. Yeah. 125 are married with what we ended up calling inter-ethnic other, but that's hugely um, um, heterogeneous group. So that includes Bangladeshi Muslims, um, Pakistani who consider themselves a religious, all these different groups. So I think that's too heterogeneous to include. Yeah. And then these are the numbers we're left with. Yes. To yes. us, we consider that even for descriptive analysis, this is very low. Yeah, it would still we be kind of an interesting benchmark, I, I think. I think with 34 people, there's so much insecurity that it's it's not that interesting. But that's a personal... Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. We made. And we felt, again, we do agree with you that this is an interesting group. But given these numbers, we felt there was not enough in there to warrant a, a comparison, especially for a book, right, where you don't want to do it in one chapter. Yeah. That is. Okay. Yeah, it's still striking as as a number that it's so low. It shows how close the community is then. Well, that's the question, right? Like again, what we that's the assumption about what it means. And and I think one important thing to realize is that interethnic marriage is based on preferences from two sides, right? Not from yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You, know, you can't marry a UK white person if they're not really willing to marry you, to put it bluntly. Yeah. Okay, thank you.
we still have um five seven minutes um until we could be done with the the seminar are there any more questions i i actually still have one but if only if nobody else has a question <laughs> go ahead <laughs> um can you show the the figure again um where you uh, show whether they marry higher educated yeah. or lower educated. Yeah, that's this one. Um, no, it's the previous one. This is, no, this is the education match. So this is the one. But not the match. Okay. Um, this is the relationship oh, between education and... It was with upper, women. with higher and lower and same. That's, yeah, that's this, this one. one. Yeah. <laughs> I I couldn't interpret it very well. You 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 said that you don't find evidence that um, transnational uh, people have uh, a lower uh, a partner or tendency to marry lower uh, educated. Yeah. If I'm so this, if I'm right, yeah. the way I read it is. If you take, for instance, UK Pakistani Muslim women, mm -hmm. then I see that the the gray bar is larger than for the intranational. Yeah. yeah. So we do find that. I did I did mention that, but maybe passing a bit too quickly. But what's at least as striking, and we would say more striking, is that for the white majority of these marriages, or uh, yeah, for the large part of these marriages. The educational level is the same, right? So a person who finished secondary school in the UK is most likely to be, if they're in a transnational marriage, to somebody from Pakistan who's also finished secondary school. Um, and this is striking if the assumption is that actually in these marriages, the focus is on tradition and getting, for instance, docile wives or uh, arranged marriage to cousins where there's no other consideration, this actually suggests, especially taking into account the differences in the educational makeup of the societies, that education does play a role. That that was the message, that, and we feel that this is supported, uh, right? So obviously, I could have also shown you a graph of the education levels of partners coming from the U, uh, coming from India and Pakistan, and you see a variation there, right? I can't remember the top of my head; it's twenty to thirty percent. Uh, have uh, a tertiary degree, so uh, university or uh, applied sciences equivalent, which is also something you don't come across in these debates, right? It's always the assumptions. These are people that have be at best have finished high school, if at all. And that's actually not what we find here. Yeah. Yeah, but in comparison to the international, it's there is a tendency to, to have more lower... Uh, educated Likely, partners, but but right? again, for the Indian for the Indian yeah. groups, we also see that there's also a tendency to be to have higher yes true. partners more often, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I agree. So it's a bit mixed view there, and also Kathy yeah. she has written a, an article about that, which she calls Sherry uh, Bright, which I guess means city brights. Um, that there, for some people, it's considered even if you're high educated, coming to the UK, even if that means marrying a low educated partner, can be attractive, right? Because it gives you access to the uh, to the UK, and you think that that offers you possibilities. Yeah, for some of these women, they were disappointed in the end, but that could make it more attractive to marry a lower educated partner than in other circumstances.